Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Pastor. Today is the Lord's Day, and it's also six months to Boxing Day. <laughs> he can't resist, you know can he? <laughs> but to bring our thoughts to worship today, I'd like to read to you a little devotional that I found. It's called A Dangerous Place. And the writer is quoting Psalm 107, verse 29. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. And who else did that? Jesus. Jesus did that, literally on the Sea of Galilee. The writer, Doug Smith, says that his daughter uh, was training to be a pilot and the navigation college required her to spend a year on the sea sailing on a cargo ship, ships and military vessels in order to gain her pilot's license. On one trip, after crossing the Mediterranean Sea, they stopped in Egypt to pick up eight seasoned sailors from a volatile country. And Egypt in recent times has been volatile. My daughter suddenly found herself in the role of mediator, even though she was trained to be a pilot, trying to work out agreements between this new set of angry workers and a captain who resisted their constant demands. While my daughter loved the adventure, she had to admit that part of the world was a dangerous place. These ancient countries had been ruled by tyrants and the damage they caused ran very deep in society. The psalmist reminds us that the sovereignty of God runs deeper still, deeper than the damage to any wicked individual, no matter how vast the resources at his disposal. Indeed, the extreme arrogance of the wicked will one day be the source of their downfall. Remember old Pharaoh in Egypt? He was arrogant. And he challenged God, and guess who came out the loser? But what do we do in the meantime? We wait for the Lord. Yes, powerful people in the world will abuse the authority they have been given by God. And history is full of that. But after we have done all we can reasonably do, we must leave the rest in God's hands. God will have the final word in all matters of injustice, as we found out in the book of Revelation. But in the meantime, we love our enemies and continue in the work God has given us to do. So the, the weight of burden is upon God. Our part is to obey him and trust him and do what he's told us to do. So that is our part, to trust in Jesus, even if we're in a dangerous place like that young lady was. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your guidance in your word and the wisdom it teaches us to put our lives totally in your hands, whether life is smooth or rough or downright dangerous. Whether it's any of those things, Lord, we pray that you would help us to learn to rest in you. And so, Lord, bless us today as we come to worship you. We ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Joe's going to come and with us. Thank you. Revelation 19, 1 to 10. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belongs to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitutes who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He had avenged on her blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise of our God and you his servants. You who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. For us, rejoice <coughs> at the glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. The fine linen stands for the righteousness acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, 
Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the Lord bless this reading. <coughs> Today we're looking at chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. And uh, from the beginning of chapter 19 onwards is future. We've been looking at many things that have happened down through history and in this chapter and uh, in the chapters ahead it talks about the rejoicing in heaven, the victorious ride of Christ, and the great war. So all heaven is rejoicing at the wedding of Christ with his bride, the true church. We know that through uh, the Bible, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God, and his bride is the church. Those who love and follow the Lord Jesus are the, church, the true church. Let's just pray as we begin this. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts to understand your word and help us, Lord, to practice what you tell us in your word. Help us to do as you, sh you have shown us. And help us, Lord, in, in our lives as we see different things happening in our world to be reminded that your coming is getting closer and closer. Help us to be ready. To meet you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All heaven is rejoicing at the wedding of Christ with his bride, the true church, and refers to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We have celebrations, don't we, when there's a wedding? There's going to be a celebration that we cannot even humanly imagine. When one day, those who love the Lord are together with the Lord and those who, down through history, down through, through time, have loved and served the Lord. We can't even fathom how beautiful that would be. Have you ever been to a, a, a wedding reception that was just really special, that you just later on just remembered details of and it encouraged and blessed you? Well, this is going to make the greatest time we've had together in a special wedding with family or friends uh, that will pale into insignificance when we think of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But chapter 19 of Revelation tells us uh, a lot of different things. It starts out talking about judgment because not only... Is it a celebration, but it's a, a, a celebration of the fact that Satan and all his followers, all his cohorts, the, the various one that's, ones talked about in Revelation, will be no more. So there's a judgment coming. And this is part of what we're reminded of here in Revelation. It gives a description of Babylon, the great harlot, seated on the seven-headed, ten-horned beast. And sometimes when we read some things in Revelation, we need to be reminded that it's symbols of various powers, world powers, different things that have happened down through history. And we've talked about that in, in recent times. It gives a description of the judgment of Satan and that description includes Babylon, the great harlot, being judged. Talks about the, the color scarlet. It's the color of the beast and the harlot and of the dragon. 
If you've ever done any reading about various uh, pagan lands around the world, it's interesting that red and black are often those colors. I'm not saying because you've got a red, oh goodness, I've got red on this morning. Because you've got some red on this morning that your evil or um, part of Satan's group, it's not what it's saying, it's that it's used as a symbol of a description of Satan. Scarlet's often used um, as a color, and it's interesting that even um, atheistic communism uses the color red and is referred to as red. Different things like this down through history. Then it talks about um, the filthiness of her fornication in Revelation 17. There's a, in, a, appalling immoralities that have happened in the name of the church that have been done down through the Middle Ages. And of course we know about the the Reformation and when those things were exposed and dealt with and how God uh, helped many people through those, those years. Talks about being drunk with the blood of the martyrs during those many years of the Inquisition, a period of about 500 years in which unnumbered millions it's estimated that 50 million Christians were died. What Christians died during those years of of the uh, Inquisition? Terrible, terrible history. And then, then it speaks about the white horse and the armies of heaven in verses 11 to 16. We had the first 10 verses uh, read to us this morning, and those were giving uh, reminders of the righteous judgments of the Lord. But it talks about the doom of the beast and the false prophet in verses 17 to 21. So the vision in verses 11 to 16 seems to be a representation of the Lord's coming in glory as King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory for those who are His, but wrath for the wicked. So at the same time as there's there's wonderful things for us to face if we love and serve the Lord, there is also a time of wrath for the wicked. It talks about in these verses the final doom of the beast and the false prophet in those last verses in the chapter. The four enemies of the Lamb the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, and Babylon are dealt with. And then next, next Sunday we will look at um, the fact that God will bring about the doom of Satan. And we will not have to worry about his attacks on us. So we'll be looking at that in the future. There is a great rejoicing of all of God's servants. A great multitude of saints will be called to worship and be glad and rejoice because the marriage supper of the Lamb and His wife, the church, has come. The great reunion day of Christ with the church. And it talks about the blood-bought church dressed in fine clean and bright linen. And that's a symbol of the righteous acts of the saints. And there's two hallelujah choruses that were read this morning in that reading. The first chorus in verses 1 to 5 expresses heaven's joyous celebration over the destruction of Babylon, the harlot church. And the second chorus announces the marriage of the Lamb to his true bride. And then there's a clear witness mentioned in verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And this is John speaking to about the angel that was giving this message. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And then John fell at his feet to worship him. But the angel said to him, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What is the spirit of prophecy? You hear all sorts of things. Sometimes you hear various Christians talk about the gift of prophecy. Well, you know, the whole book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. And that's why it's been given to us, so that we are aware of the things that will happen and have happened and will happen before Christ returns. But what is the spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy? There's only a couple of examples, actually, in, in the New Testament of Christian prophecy. And one is found in the book of Acts, chapter 11. It says in Acts 11, 27 to 28, in, the, in those days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. And then later in Acts 21.10, it talks about this prophet Agabus coming from Judea and speaking to the people. How do we know when something is genuinely prophecy from the Lord? So there's a lot of people in our world that claim that they have God's word to share with you about something, sometimes even something very specific in your life. I think I used this illustration in the past when we lived in Hobart. We had a, a Christian friend, and uh, one day she came to visit me, which was lovely, but, and she brought along a friend with her. I'd never met this lady before, but she walked in the door, and literally, I mean, it's fine. I mean, in North Queensland, you do tend to take your shoes off, but in Tassie, it's not kind of things that people do. Not that that really mattered, but I can still remember walking in the door and kicking off her shoes, giving them a toss, and said, where's the cuppa? Basically like that. She was very forward sort of a person, and I'm like, oh, never met this lady before. But um, she was very bubbly sort of person, very out there, um, and she was a friend of my friend, and so I welcomed her in my home. But then within a very short time, she was getting out her Bible. This isn't a Bible here, but this is a hymn book. But she was getting out her Bible and thumbing through it and giving me a word of prophecy. And she'd read. I really had to keep from laughing because it was really quite funny. Because she would open the Bible and read from here, and then she'd go and read that. How about if I do that with this hymn book? Right. Heartaches all ended. That's what I just said. Almost persuaded. In the stillness of this moment. That's how she read the Bible to me. And those, that was the prophecy for me to take that day and guide my life. She was doing that not with a, a hymn book, but with the Bible. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And then she talk, started telling me a bit of tasty gossip. And she was telling me about this man in the town, a Christian man. He claim, claims to be a Christian, but did you know he's, he's got this woman on the side and he, his wife doesn't know. And, and I, I just said, excuse me, I don't want to hear anymore. I said, I know that man. She didn't count on that. I said, I know that man. I know nothing about his, whether what you're saying is true or not. But you have just effectively colored my mind over that man by what you've said, and I won't have that. I'm sorry. Kind of offended my friend because she had invited her friend along to meet me. And it was very awkward. It was very, very sad, really. But that wasn't prophecy, folks. That was gossip. And that was using God's word to sanction what she said to me. How do we know when something is truly a word from God? It's good. It's probably godly. And it's godly. It's from the Bible. 
It lines up with what it says in here, and not randomly, you know, you know about the man that wanted God's guidance, so he opened the Bible and it said, and Judas went and hung himself. And he's like, whoa. And then he flipped real quick to another spot and said, and go and do likewise. <sighs> that's not how God guides. <laughs> but that's a, that was meant to be a silly example of what you can make the Bible say. That is not how we read the Bible. Do you read other books like that? How many of you like to read? Do you pick up a book and go, oh, let's see, you know, chapter 5. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Oh, I don't like that. No, uh, it doesn't make any sense like that. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Should we do that with the Bible then? Now, I know the Bible is written with, in 66 books, it's written with chapters and, and headings. By the way, folks, remember that the headings in your Bible and in my Bible might be different. The headings are simply to help you remember what's on that page. They're not inspired words of God. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the Bible is not all inspired. I'm saying that headings, like in this one I've got at the top of my page, the marriage of the Lamb. And it's above the part of my Bible where it goes down to chapter 20 because it's at the end of 19 and 20 on this page. Yours might say, may not even have a heading, or it may say something else. Do you see what I'm trying to say? That's just help to help us find our plates. Also, do you realize the chapter numbers, the verse numbers, were put in later on, long many years after the Bible was written. They were put in there so we could find our place. It was as the manuscripts were being taken to be printed as a Bible, that they needed some way of finding your place in the Bible. So they put chapter numbers, verse numbers in the Bible. Okay, because sometimes you might even have a translation that has that has something another person's Bible may not have done. It may include something from the next chapter, kind of puts it together as it, as it was all part of that topic. If you're kind of following what I'm saying, it follows that topic along maybe into the next chapter. And so it divides things a little bit different just so that we get the flow of what is being said. It's really good when you read the Bible to read as much as you can at one time to sort of get the flow of what it's saying. Okay, so I'm saying those things are there for us to help us as we read the Bible so we know where we're up to, right? But when we read the Bible, we need to make sure that people who are sharing God's Word are really sharing God's Word. We can only know that if we're reading the Bible and committing it to memory. That's why it's important to learn the Bible. So what is the, the uh, prophecy? What, how do we test the prophecy? We test it with God's Word. So we need to read God's Word and see what it really says. In Colossians 2.18, it suggests that some Christians have been led into the worship of angels. You know, in recent years, in the oh, last 10, 20 years or so, uh, there have been people, Christian people, that have gotten caught up in the worship of angels. Now, angels are wonderful. But what happened here when, when John said to the angel, he... he he, he says he fell at his feet to worship the angel. And the angel said, See, you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does Jesus say in his word? Check out what you hear by that measure. The church is called to weigh prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14, 29. And according to 1 John, the same author of, of Revelation, the same author said in the book of 1 John 4, 1, Christians are not to trust every spirit as they are not all the Holy Spirit. 
So just when someone says, oh, I'm a Christian and I've got a word for you from God, well, thank him very kindly, but check it out with God. Check it out with what God says. We're not to test every, to trust every spirit, but as not all are from the Holy Spirit. And in Revelation, we read about a church that was affected by a woman who, who John calls Jezebel. But she, she called herself a prophetess. And that was in Revelation 2.20. Remember when we read about the seven churches? There was a woman in one of the churches functioning within the church, called herself a prophetess, but she was causing great problems in that church. And this can happen. We need to be aware of these things. It's talking in Revelation 19, 20, verse 20. The beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So there are people who will try to fool us as Christians by miracles. So he worked signs. So don't just say, well, this person did this wonderful miracle. He must be from God. Well, they, they had this issue way back in the time of John. We need to test the spirits, test those who are saying these things you know what? There's all kinds of things happening in our world, all kinds of prophecies and people doing these sort of things. We need to be aware of that. So what is the testimony or witness of Jesus? The phrase itself occurs several times in Revelation and a related phrase in Revelation 17. So there's several references here, verse one, chapter 1, verse 2, and 9, 12, 17, chapter 19, verse 10, and 20, verse 4. So it talks about a witness. It's the testimony of Jesus that one makes by conforming to his commands and confessing allegiance and confessing and speaking his truth. In other words, those who claim to be a Christian live like the Lord Jesus. If someone says they're a Christian and they're not living like Jesus, their testimony is false. Now, I'm not saying you go around and pick fault with people, that sort of thing, but by their fruits, you will know them. How do we know an apple tree is an apple tree? It bears what? Apples. Apples. All right. So by the fruit of their life, you will know who is following Jesus. If they are living for Jesus and following him and doing what Jesus teaches in his word. We are called to be a witness for Jesus. And it talks about in Revelation, the various witnesses. The Antipas in Revelation 2. The martyrs it mentions right through, and particularly in, verse, in chapter 6. The two witnesses in Revelation 11, and the victors. A true testimony to Jesus means obedience to his commands and faithfulness to his teaching. Life and word go together. The Christian who does not live like Jesus is a contradiction in terms. In, in 17, uh, Revelation 17, 6, it says that the saints bore testimony to Jesus. That is the true spirit of prophecy. True prophecy inspired by the Holy Spirit will be in conformity to the life and teaching of Jesus. So if someone is taken away from what Jesus has taught and how Jesus lived, you know they are not following the Lord Jesus. Because what we say and what we do needs to point others to Jesus. So by this standard, one can evaluate the life and words of a prophet. 
So revelation then is an attempt to uphold the standards that Jesus taught and lived. It's not the messenger who should be honored. Sometimes people say, oh, he's a great preacher. He's, he's doing this, he's doing that, or he's a great prophet of God. It's not the prophet who should be honored. It's the Lord who should be honored. The true prophet is the prophet who lives like Jesus, teaches in harmony with Jesus, and points others to Jesus as their Lord and King. So, you and I, what do we do? The great day of the Lord is coming. When the saints, as the song says, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. And that same song goes on to say, are you ready for the judgment day? We love it when Sue sings the song uh, that, she, that she has. The, there's a, are you ready? We're just trying, are you ready to go home? Are you ready to meet the king? It's a beautiful song. The great day of the Lord is coming and the Lord will judge all of these that's mentioned here in Revelation. He will judge those who have tried to get others to follow them, the false prophet and those who received the mark of the beast. And one day the Lord will be united forever with his bride, the church. The saints of all ages and all nations there will be absolute rejoicing in heaven with the great multitude praising the Lord for his salvation, for glory, honor, power, and righteous judgment of the Lord. There's no one name that we could even describe the Lord with. We've talked about uh, him being the Lamb of God. He's our God. He's our, the Lamb of God, the faithful and true, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God, King of kings and Lord of lords. All who love and know the Lord are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's going to be a wedding reception like no other. And our part is to be faithful to the Lord until death. The Lord himself promises in Revelation 2, verse 10, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. To those who are going away from the Lord, going cool in their love for the Lord, we need to turn around before it is too late. Jesus himself invites us to come to him. I am standing at the door, he says, and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. So, where are you at in this journey? Are you following the Lord Jesus Christ to heaven? Or are you following Satan to hell? It comes right down to that, doesn't it? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a song that has these words. Some glorious morning sorrow will cease. Some glorious morning all will be peace. Heartaches all ended. I love this bit. Kids like this part. School days all done. <laughs> School holidays next couple of weeks. But um, Kids love it when it's holidays, don't they? Heaven will open. Jesus will come. Sad hearts will gladden. All shall be bright. Goodbye forever to earth's dark night. Changed in a moment like him to be. O glorious daybreak, Jesus I'll see. Oh, what a meeting there in the skies. No tears nor crying shall dim our eyes. Loved ones united eternally. Oh, what a daybreak that morn will be. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles all won. He'll shout the victory, break through the blue. Some golden daybreak, for me, for you. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, help us to keep our eyes looking 
for the return of the Lamb for his bride, the church. Help us to be a part of that group. Help us not to turn away. Help us to keep following you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymn books to number